We have a new series that we've started. We're preaching on the gospel. This is a topical series and not a book series, uh, which we haven't done in quite a while, a topical series. Uh, We've been going through books, so we'll be uh, going through another book after this uh, topical series. Topical series, of course, is on the gospel, and all of those words, of course, mean what we find there in the middle, gospel, good news, euangelion, which is Greek, means good news or gospel. That's how it's translated. And uh, last week we were talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ and how it seems to be under, uh, well, I think it's always been under attack. I think Satan knows that this is the message uh, that, uh, that has the power to bring people to where they need to be with God. And I think he's been attacking the gospel since the beginning, trying to get people to have a misunderstanding of it, uh, maybe not have the appreciation they should have for it. And just by the mere fact that so many people are talking about the gospel these days, I believe that uh, we, we need to have a time every now and then where we just really stop, pause, clarify this message and make sure that everyone understands it clearly. Uh, so let me just say last week I'd ask you to write either what uh, you thought of the gospel as how what it means to you or the gospel what it means, not what it means to you, but uh, what it means. So did you, uh, I know June, uh, she wrote some things she's going to share the gospel. I just want to hear what we're thinking about the gospel. Again, I say, you know, we have the gospel coalition. We have the together for the gospel. We have um, R.C. Sproul getting the gospel right. Matt Chandler explicit gospel. I mean, there's just so many books on the gospel. We just want to take a time to make sure that we have a clear understanding. June, you want to come share? Want to come up here and read out? No, it'll go quick, I'm sure. Let, let's see how this mic works right here. It's on, but let's see how it works. Yeah, sure. Just come test it out and see. Just speak a little bit louder. Is that long? Is that loud enough? Sure. Sounds good. That wasn't long, long at all. Okay. Anyone else do their assignment? 
You have something on your paper there? <laughs> that was very... That, okay, you want to come say it where everybody can hear it? Because I know it would be hard for everybody to hear. It's okay. <laughs> I just really want to hear what we're, what we're thinking. Very good. <laughs> it's all right. All right. Anybody else? I just wanted to hear. No need for me to get up and down if someone has, has something to share. Okay. If you didn't write anything, you can just get up and tell us what the gospel is. Just give us the gospel. Let me hear it. Good. Anybody else? Okay, let me hear it, Brother Jess. You want to come up here? <laughs> I know I won't be able to hear you, so. Undeserved gift. Good job, Jess. Thank you, brother. All right. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Say your favorite verse. And I remember when I first heard it, I was yeah, verse in that whole section. And it started with verse seventeen. Sure. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, old is passed away, behold, comes. All this is from God. Christ reconciled us to himself, us the ministry of Christ. So he reconciled us that with the gospel. Really, these things, and and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ. God making His appeal through us, we implore you, be reconciled to God. When I think what to say to folks, things that I might think is reconciled to God. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Wonderful. I've just been waiting for somebody to read John 316. I thought somebody would read John 316. <laughs> Yeah, if somebody can quote it. That would be good. That's a good cap- encapsulated for presentation. 
Go ahead, I'm listening. There it is. Simple, isn't it? God loved, God gave. Who believes? All right. <clears throat> this is the core of, the, of, of our doctrine, the gospel. Get this wrong, everything's wrong. If we don't have this right, we're in trouble. And uh, there's so many presentations, as I said last week, that we've added words in front of the word gospel to prove that we're distorting it. The social gospel, that's not the gospel, the social gospel, the prosperity gospel. When you put words in front of the word gospel, you're distorting it. Actually, the true gospel should have some words following it. These words in particular, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the word the definite article belongs in front of the word gospel, and that's the only word that we should put, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's interesting as we're reading the gospels in our Bible, it is the gospel according to Matthew, the gospel according to Luke, the gospel, uh, Mark, the gospel, all of them are the gospel. It's their gospel record inspired of God as they're giving the record of the gospel. It's interesting that the gospel writers do not start in the same place, but still they all have the same essential uh, components of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, the gospel, as I said last week, is um, a message. It's a message to be conveyed. In other words, we are supposed to be, uh, not if we're gospel believers, if we've exceed, received the gospel, we're supposed to be gospel preachers or those who share the gospel with people because the message must be conveyed. And when it's conveyed and received by faith, it grants a life to be lived. And so it's not just something we believe. It's something that actually conveys uh, and grants to us uh, a life, a life of forgiveness, a life of, uh, of empowerment, a life of uh, hope for the future, a life of enjoyment here in sharing uh, the life, this life with others that we have in Christ. So it's a continuing enjoyment and communion with the Father through Jesus Christ by the presence of the Holy Spirit. This is what it comes to produce in our life. So we can't just leave it there as a message. It is a message that, when conveyed, grants a life to be lived and uh, has a power. As Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Now, last week we were also making mention of the fact that the gospel, as I said, is the central message of the Christian church. We can't get this wrong. It has to be right. And it's, it's something we have to agree on. If we do not agree on the gospel, then we can't be in fellowship. So uh, this is the very uh, key point. And, and it reminds me just to go back to the reason why there was a Reformation is because the gospel was in question. That's what we have to understand. When you start telling people that they can buy their salvation, you're preaching another gospel. That's uh, that which is not another is not another gospel, but as Paul said, but you're preaching something that is not the gospel. And naturally, uh, Martin Luther had to stand up and say the gospel is at stake here, and we have to preach the gospel and not allow that. That's the core, and not allow that to be uh, in any way uh, misconstrued or uh, not clearly presented. And it really makes me understand. Uh, it makes me question rather. How many years the church, the Catholic Church, uh, allowed uh, people to just be deceived about how how they are saved? You know, uh, I'm not saying that there weren't any Catholics saved because then we would say Martin Luther wasn't saved himself, or we'd say uh, Saint Augustine wasn't saved, and so, so many of them were saved. But I think they had to have the gospel right, and thereby. Uh, have a problem with, though maybe not as clearly stated as Martin Luther's opposition, but a problem with, I don't really see things that way. Uh, saved by grace, Martin Luther's great awakening and understanding 
allowed us to come to where we are today, having the privilege to stand and share the gospel as it really is, and not to be in any way confused with uh, church polity that was welded pretty well to a message of Jesus some years ago. Let me read a few other verses to you. Thank you all for sharing, and I'm sure everyone uh, has a, a presentation in their mind of to how to share the gospel. Let me read what I was reading last week, and we'll springboard from there to what I want to share with you tonight. Uh, John chapter 20, just what John wrote. John wrote the gospel, uh, his the gospel according to John, John chapter 20, and we, let me just read these verses. Um, Verse 27, Jesus said to Thomas, reach hither your finger and uh, and look at my hands and reach hither your hand here, put it in my side, do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said, my Lord and my God. And so let me just say that Jesus at this point right here, just so we can fall into this text and get it in our head as to where we are. Of course, Jesus has died. He's resurrected. He's now appearing to the disciples. We know that Thomas questioned his resurrection. And we see that Jesus is saying something to Thomas that is very important to the mission of the church, uh, to the mission of the, the apostles. And that is to say that people are not going to continue to uh, re- demand uh, what what Thomas is demanding here, and that is a... Um, a tangible evidence of of Jesus' resurrection. So this is the last time because Jesus goes on to say, uh, Thomas, uh, to Thomas, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And so the gospel is a message, as I said, when conveyed and believed, it grants the blessing of life in Christ. So it's not... Uh, Jesus is saying to Thomas here, it's not going to be like this anymore. People are going to believe and receive the blessing of life and the blessing of the gospel, which leads to what uh, John writes next. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So these things are written, here's a message, being conveyed by the apostle in writing. It's being conveyed by those who read it and proclaim it. It's being conveyed. And then when a person hears it and believes on the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God, they're believing brings them life in his name. So it's a whole new paradigm here. We're not having uh, signs and wonders, and though we may see some of those things follow the apostles for a period of time, Jesus is saying, no, what's going to happen is people are going to hear the gospel, people are going to believe the gospel, people are going to receive a benefit and a blessing when they believe, and that is life in his name. So things have changed here. The the gospel is the message that the church carries uh, out to the world. So we were talking about this last week and and how John is just saying he did signs. Those signs uh, manifested evidence of his identity and his mission. And now this is how you are blessed, by not by having other signs, but by hearing the message. Let me read John's first letter. So let's just look there just for a moment. So we go from the Gospel of John to 1 John, the first letter of John, and let's see what he says here. So turn there with me just for a minute. 1 John chapter 1. He said, That which which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked on and our hands have handled concerning the uh, word of life, The life was manifested. We have seen it. He's not saying you have to see it. We have seen it. And we bear witness and declare to you that that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. So he's basically, again, saying it's the message that we have been given that that we convey to you, that we speak to you. You don't have to see the life. You don't have to see and witness Christ personally. 
You have to listen to what we're saying because this is how the blessing comes, by conveying the gospel, preaching the gospel. And I'm emphasizing, I don't know if I'm doing a good job emphasizing it, but what I'm trying to say is there are a lot of things that people are trying to put in church ministry today that take away from the emphasis of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And those things were not given to us uh, as a means of conveying the message necessarily. We just preach it by the, by the power of the Spirit of God who inspired it, and God works in hearts as a result of their hearing the Word of God. So this is a, just a, a new uh, understanding from the disciples having followed Jesus these years that they walk with Him. It's going to be totally different. He's not going to be showing up. He's not going to be manifesting Himself. You preach the gospel, and by the preaching of the gospel, people come to know Christ and are saved. You understand what I'm saying? You say, well, is there a particular reason why you're saying this? Yes, because I believe there are a lot of churches today that emphasize signs and wonders and miracles and things of that, and somehow the gospel gets totally lost in all of that, and people are coming for the show, if I could say it. They come for the show. They don't come for the gospel. They don't come for the word. So the disciples, the apostles, were basically making it clear, you're not going to see Jesus, you're not going to handle Jesus, and you're not going to be with Jesus. He has sent us living witnesses of that to give the word. And when you hear the word, that's when you're going to receive the blessing. So by hearing and believing, so we even have in the book of Romans, of course, uh, the scripture that tells us that faith comes by Hearing, not by seeing, not by touching, not by feeling, but by hearing. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. I mean, this is just very clear. And what's really muddling the waters today is that there are so many people going for some kind of of show. Come see what's going to happen. And I believe even when Jesus preached, a lot of people went to see, but they didn't go to hear. And we can see that when Jesus was performing miracles and feeding the thousands and they continued to follow him because they wanted him to do more miracles, namely feed them more of the miracle food that they had been fed with before. He said, you follow me, not you follow me for the fishes, basically, is what he said to the people following. And then he gave them a real strong word. He said, you have to eat of the bread of life and I'm the bread of life. And when he preached that word, crowd dispersed and left and went home because he wasn't going to do a miracle for them. And I just want to remind you that Jesus said, according to two of the gospel records, Jesus said this, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh signs, and there will be no sign given it except the the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days, so the Son of Man will be in in the earth for three days. So that's the only sign he was giving, and when he came out of the grave, he gave the only sign that he needed to give, for Paul said, Paul said, if he's not risen, then we're yet in our sins. And we're liars. This is not good news. This is not any news if he's not risen. So the only sign that Jesus was going to give was his resurrection. After the resurrection, he appeared to eyewitnesses who told the story, wrote the story, and here we are passing it on today. And I have all confidence in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ as being the only hope for the world, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I just want to, I want to put that before you, that we have to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I said last week that there are words that we need to hear in the gospel of Jesus Christ, words like sin and judgment, uh, love, and repentance. I mean, these are words that need to, need to come into play. We need to talk about the crucifixion. We need to talk about the atonement. We need to talk about the resurrection. We need to talk about the ascension. And these things were mentioned tonight, the ascension. And also, just as important, is the message of His coming again. It's very important. So as we're talking about the gospel, we distance ourselves from the need of trying to present something in the form of a sign or a miracle and realize that that, according to the apostles, we've walked away from that so that what we're doing today is preaching the gospel. 
Uh, you remember Philip and the eunuch? You remember that story? You remember what happened? You remember how uh, God sent Philip to preach to the eunuch? And what was he doing? What was the eunuch doing? He was reading the Word of God. <laughs> and, and what happened? Did Philip say, well, why don't you put that down and let me show you a few things God has given me the power to do? And No, he, he didn't do a miracle for him. He didn't. He, he said, the, the, the eunuch said, who, uh, who is this guy talking about? And what happened from that point? Philip took from that scripture, Philip preached the gospel to the eunuch and he was saved. You remember that? And so why do we have, why do we not have confidence in the power of the gospel to bring about the result that God wants for people in this world? Why would we not be a church that emphasizes the importance of preaching the gospel to our children and to our loved ones and to our co-workers and to our community? I said this last week. I just want to emphasize that I believe that my hope is, as a result of going through this, that we will be people with a greater appreciation of the gospel. We'll be people who love the gospel who expect the gospel to be presented and expect God to use us in some way, form, or fashion to present the gospel to people. And uh, so this is just important. And by the way, I just want you to know that the, the social gospel and the prosperity gospel are gaining momentum. Those gospel, the, those false messages are gaining momentum. And there needs to be more and more uh, individual churches standing firm on the gospel message, just preaching the truth of the gospel and believing God that faith will come by hearing and hearing by the word. Okay, I'm all for that now. Okay, got that. All right, now let me just share something. I love to hear the way the writers share the gospel, don't you? I mean, we're listening to people share tonight the gospel. I love it. I think it's wonderful. And I hear the essential elements or components of the gospel in our testimonies tonight. I love that. Uh, Let me share with you uh, Peter's presentation of the gospel in 1 Peter. I just want you to see it. We're going to slowly go through it and just uh, move at just a snail's pace. We're not going to rush through it. I just want you to hear it uh, as though you never heard it before. So I'm going to begin with uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. I'll just begin uh, in the first verse. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Meaning what? Meaning one who has witnessed the resurrection of Jesus. One who's been sent out from the resurrection of Jesus, the resurrected, the presence of the resurrected Jesus, with the commission, this is the apostle, with the commission to share the evidence and testimony of of the resurrected Christ and his message. So apostles are anointed and appointed leaders to share the message of the resurrected Christ as eyewitnesses. To the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. And I would just like to say, if we move at a snail's pace through verse 2, we could probably be here for a while. The word elect probably would uh, throw a lot of people, and we probably would have to be there for a while. Let me just ask you, as I'm going through this, I know we have a lot of ESV readers. We have ESV readers here? Okay. Give me your word, the very first word of verse 2. Okay, you don't have the word elect. One. Is it in verse one? Okay. So in my Bible, I'm reading from the New King James, they put elect in verse two. And let me just, we'll talk about that. According to what? The foreknowledge of God the Father. Now, I'm just going to tell you, if I were to stop right here and spend a little bit of time in Ephesians chapter one, we would find this fleshed out. Peter's talking about it. Paul emphasizes it with such clarity and and authority. Both are inspired of the Spirit, but Peter will bring us to another emphasis. Paul takes this emphasis and taps down deep. So let me just read it to you so that we don't have to uh, have my comments on it, but just Scripture, Scripture giving us commentary on Scripture. 
So this is how Paul would say it. Peter's moving on to another subject. Paul would say, let me take that subject and go there with you. Blessed be the, this is Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Or if you have an ESV, in love having predestined. So I know it moves over, moves words. So uh, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved in him. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us with all wisdom and prudence having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself. That in the dispensation of the fullness of time that he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, which are on earth, in him, in him also having obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Pretty deep, huh? What's important? What is important is for us to know that the gospel is not a new story. It's the old story. It's the old, old story. It's before the foundation of the world. God had made plans for his son to come on a mission to reconcile people to himself. When we hear words, and by the way, I'm just going to say sometimes when people hear the word elect, our people hear the word chosen in him before the foundation of the world, or predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. These words are not necessarily synonymous because they have some different nuance that we probably should bring out, but it is important for us to see that God, before the foundation of the world, had a plan, and actually, according to Ephesians chapter 1, he has chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world. According to Ephesians chapter 1, he has predestined us according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his will. Two things I want to say about this. Number one, how many of you know that God's thoughts are not our thoughts? Now, where do we put God's thoughts and his ways? Higher than our thoughts. And this is what's so marvelous about the reading of Scripture and the reading and the preaching even of the gospel is that there's more in it than we have ever even thought. There's so much more in the gospel. And when we hear words like that, chosen in him, predestined, elect, these words are very important words to all of the apostles. Paul hammers it really hard. Peter mentions it because it needs to be mentioned However, Peter says, according to the foreknowledge of God. Let me just let me uh, quote one other one other scripture. Or read one other scripture when we get back to Peter's presentation because this is important. In Romans chapter eight, so God's thoughts when He begins to share with us the gospel under the pen and the inspiration that these apostles are writing uh, by the inspiration of the Spirit, things come out that are just so majestic, so powerful. I just want you to hear Romans chapter 8, and then I'll get back. Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 says, We know all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are, to those who are, what does it say? Called according to his purpose, Ephesians chapter 1. He works all things after the counsel of his own will. For whom he did for no. You see that? He also predestined. What did he predestine? He predestined what? To be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, he also called, and whom he called, he also justified, and whom he justified, he also glorified. And I bring to your attention that each one of these words in verse 30 are past tense. So he predestined past tense EDs on the end of that word. He called, past tense. He justified, past tense. 
He glorified past tense, meaning that God speaks outside of what we call time and space. He doesn't live where we live. Before the foundation of the world, God knows everything. God plans everything in the counsel of his will. Everything is already done. I like to say that the ED on the end of all of these words could be ED could be eternally done. It's, it's already done in the mind of God. He's predestined, he's called, he's justified, he's glorified. So all things are working together for the good to those who are called according to his purpose. He's working everything else, everything in this world, out for his purposes. So when we come to Peter writing the word elect according to the foreknowledge of God, he's just simply saying God has, before the foundation of the world, made a plan. Nothing can thwart the plan of God. It has to do with God saving a people for himself. And the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who said, let there be, and there was, also even before he said, let there be, and there was, had a plan to redeem a people who had not yet even been born, to save a people who had not yet even fallen. It's an amazing thing to think with the thoughts of God, but this is a glorious thing. The gospel is not a new story. God didn't fall in love with us one day in our life, but before there ever was a day in our life, he he was in love with us and made plans by his grace to come to our rescue. So it's very important for us to see that. And I would say that uh, in the Romans passage, one thing that's very clear that God has predetermined and predestined, and that is that every person who comes to God through Christ is going to be conformed to the image of his son. Very important for you to see that. When we get beyond a lot of things that we may question with regard to these words, so many times they're confusing to people. There shouldn't be confusion when we believe God knows all things and does all things according to the counsel of his will. Just that simple. And so we look at God working, God doing things that just simply, it's just God doing what he does. He does everything according to the counsel of his will and to the praise of his glory. And so we just keep reading these things that the gospel is not a new story. God has always loved a people he set his affection on and a people that he has come to rescue. Now, so let's save uh, some of that for a little bit later because we're not finished with that subject, but I'm just touching on it because we're reading it here. Peter's presentation. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God and the sanctification of the Spirit for the obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Christ. So this is another thing I just want to say to you, that the blood of Jesus is essential for our salvation. And there have been some denominations who've taken blood out of their songbooks. They've taken blood out of their message. They don't talk about the blood of Jesus. But the Bible tells us that the life of the flesh is in the blood. And so if he gave his life, he gave his blood. And the blood of Christ, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Right? So we just have to understand that. When Adam and Eve sinned against God, what did God do? It's a a terrible picture, I know, but when Adam and Eve sinned against God, they hid from God, and how did they hide? They they cut some limbs off of some fig trees. I think I would have chosen something else, but they chose a fig tree to cut some leaves off of and make them aprons so that they kind of blended in. The first camouflage suit ever put on a man, Adam and Eve made it, and they're standing there, and they're hiding, and it's it's (laughs) it's so pitiful, but... They're actually hiding with dead stuff on them. I mean, as soon as they cut the limbs, the the life of that plant was dead. They're they're dead in the sense that they cannot uh, have the relationship they had with God, and and they're hiding with uh, dead things on their body, dead these leaves off of these uh, fig trees, and uh, and so when God meets them, God does want to cover their sin, but not with leaves. How does he want to cover their sin with skins? And what does that require? Death, blood, the shedding of blood. And it was in that first sacrifice that that God made just to cover the shame of their nakedness so that they wouldn't stand there 
ashamed before God, it was only symbolic of the fact that one day blood would be shed that would eventually completely cover sin, and sin would be remitted, and God would take care of that. So it's just interesting to go back and see from the beginning that God was showing that blood had to be shed. So Peter is really hammering that point. The blood of Christ had to be shed. Uh, That's very important in the gospel. God knew us. God chose us. God elected us. God has a people he's saving. He's going to have a remnant. He's not... He's not going to be without the people he sent his son for. They're going to be saved, uh, and they're going to be saved because Jesus uh, shed his blood for their salvation. Now let's read verse 3. Blessed be the God, First Peter, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his ber- abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Again, we we talk about in the gospel the bl- the blood of Christ the will of God the the plan of God before the foundation of the world the will of God the blood of Christ being shed the grace of God being expressed to us and and in this particular verse we're talking about some more key components his abundant mercy and the resurrection of Jesus Christ as i said a moment ago if Jesus is not risen we're yet in our sins and all people most miserable He's purchased us to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Aren't you glad of that? So Jesus said to his disciples, other components is, he saved us. He saved us that we might be with him forever. What did he say to his disciples? I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. Heaven's part of the story. Jesus died to forgive us of our sins, to reconcile us. Chris, good word. Uh, bringing that to our attention, to reconcile us in a relationship with God so that we might spend eternity with God in heaven, and that is reserved for us. That is, God has reserved a place for us and blessings for us for all eternity. And we're kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So in this particular verse of Scripture, verse 5 of First Peter chapter 1, it is God who keeps us, it is God who who makes certain that we're not only saved, but eternally secure. Can you lose your salvation? Absolutely not. Why? Because it wasn't something you did anyway. It was something God did. And when you say you can lose your salvation, you're saying something God did can be undone. What God did cannot be undone. Once you're saved, you're always saved. If you're saved, you're always saved. I mean, that's just clear. So basically, we're kept by the power of, of God, and all the blessings are, are yea and amen through Christ. And so in this, verse 6, the gospel, God's plan for us, God's will for us, uh, Jesus' obedience and shedding his blood, God's mercy to us, his grace to us, God having begotten us to a lively hope through the resurrection of Jesus All these are key components to the gospel of Jesus Christ and that he has reserved for us an inheritance in heaven, which is for us, and we're kept by the power of God, and all of those things are promised, yea, and amen, by the power of God through faith for our salvation, which is ready to be revealed in the last time. And by the way, I just want to say the conveying of the message of the gospel grants to us a blessing of life in Christ. And that blessing is called salvation. When we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we're saved, we are saved, but we are also being saved. You understand? In other words, we are eternally secure in Christ, but we are being saved from many of the things that are about us in this world. We're being saved slowly from, progressively from the power of sin in our life, right? We're being saved, ultimately we'll be saved from the very presence of it. But it's important for us to understand that Jesus prayed this. And I love, I just, I love thinking about this when Jesus said to the Father in John 17, Father, they are not of this world, even as I am not of this world. And I do not pray that you take them out of this world, 
but that you keep them from the evil one, basically. So I'm saved because I'm not of this world. That's what Jesus said. Even as he's not of this world, I'm saved. But I'm in this world. And because of all the danger that's in this world, Jesus, Jesus prayed, keep them from the evil one. So I'm saved eternally secure as far as my soul is concerned. But in this world, I'm being saved all the time from all the danger about me. I'm being saved from the power of sin in my life. I'm being saved progressive, progr- progressively from that. And so I think that's very important for us to understand that we are saved and being saved all along at the same time. God is saving us from all sorts of things about us. And um, and one day that, that will be over. Right? That will be, it will be the end. And through faith, we'll have a salvation that's ready to be revealed, all of the benefits and blessings of salvation. In this, and here's, in this, you greatly rejoice. Listen, you greatly rejoice. And that's why I said a moment ago, I hope as a result, when we're finished with this series, I hope that in this, we greatly rejoice. That is, in our salvation, in the blessings of God through uh, grace and faith. Uh, we have all of these things that have come to us through the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we greatly rejoice. Does that mean that everything's going well? No, Paul, uh, Peter says, though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials. It doesn't mean everything's just going great. But when you start thinking about all that you have in Jesus, all that you have through uh, through the gospel of Christ, then you should have uh, an experience of greatly rejoicing. It says in verse 7 that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to the praise and the honor and the glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what does that mean? God's people are people who rejoice. How many of you remember the, the scripture uh, where it says in Second John, rejoice in the Lord. And what, what does he say? And what is that? Rejoice in the Lord. No. Let me see if I can find it. Is it Philippians 4.4? 4? I'm thinking it's John. Rejoice in the Lord and, and again, I say rejoice. Yeah. Is it 4.4? 4? Yeah. Thank you, brother. <laughs> I don't know why I got John in my head here tonight. Rejoice in the Lord and again, I say rejoice. Because I think that's that's just a that's just that's something that we as as believers need to understand. We are rejoicing people, so we have a reason to be rejoicing, and it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are the beneficiaries of the gospel of Christ, and we should be rejoicing. So we find in the scripture that we rejoice even though we have trials and troubles and tribulations. We continue to rejoice because that which brings the joy. In our life is the Lord, rejoice in the Lord, and uh, that never changes. And let me just show you a couple of other things, components of the gospel that we need to keep our focus on. He says in verse 8, whom having not seen, you, you what? You love. And though you do not see him, yet you what? Yet believing, you Rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And of this salvation, the prophets have inquired, listen to this, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. I mean, the prophets wanted to know what you know. They wanted to see the fulfillment of what we have seen the fulfillment of. Verse 11, searching what? Or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified before the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. 
The prophets wanted to see what we have seen, and and they rejoiced having not seen it, just knowing that something was coming. We have seen it. We should be rejoicing with great joy. And then he says, to them it was revealed that not, not to themselves but to us, they were ministering the things which have now been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. (laughs) Now I'm going to tell you, if the prophets wanted to know what we now know and the angels desire to understand what we now know, I'm telling you, we are blessed people. How could we ever take the emphasis off of this message, which was so important to the prophets, so amazing to the angels? How could we ever take the emphasis off of the gospel as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? How could we ever do that? And how could we ever preach it without praising God for it, without greatly rejoicing in it? And so tonight, I I just want to ask you to think about the gospel of Jesus Christ, all of these components in the gospel of Christ, the the, the the wisdom and the counsel of God that he chose us and, and brought us into us. It's not that we wanted him, but that he wanted us. It's not that we loved him, but that he first loved us. It's all that he was doing to have us to himself. God wanted us. Isn't that something to be excited about? God has worked in such a way by the power of his spirit to convict us of our need of salvation. He has worked also by the Spirit to lead us into a faith in Christ. He has worked by the Spirit to place us in a body, the body of Christ, in union with Christ. These are things for which we should be grateful. We have the privilege not only to know the gospel of Jesus Christ, to live the gospel of Jesus Christ, and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, but to be in a fellowship and a family that has the benefits as well. I'm going to just tell you, as I read these things that the angels wanted to know and the prophets wanted to know, and we know there should be a lot of praise, it seems, Peter is saying, that's coming out of the family of God. Just because we are his. We're born again. So, let me just ask this question. What brings you great joy? It's not a trick question. God's love for you, expressed through Christ, and God's grace in allowing you to see your need of all that he's provided, that should cause us to greatly rejoice in Christ. Well, the gospel, I'm going to preach next next Wednesday, I'm going to preach on... I'm going to preach on the preparation for hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Preparation. How are we prepared to hear it? And and maybe you can share your testimony next week, not the gospel, but share your testimony of how you heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's going to be different. I know people heard different ways, different places, but it's the same gospel. And God brought you to himself. So I'm going to ask you, what happened? How is it that you came to believe in the Lord Jesus? So next week, let's have some personal testimonies. And I'm just going to tell you that this is going to take us, the the subject next week is going to take us back to the Old Testament. Because what I want you to see is that the Old Testament was a record of God working with people, still by His grace, God working with people who just needed to know who they really were. They needed to see themselves as God saw them, and the law was given to help them see. So next week we're going to be there. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And while it's under attack today and people want to put words in front of it and change the meaning of it, And, Lord, there are people who want to come and have show. They want to have something going on that's exciting. How could we ever be more excited about anything than the gospel of Jesus Christ and your love for us? How could we ever be more excited about anything that you have loved us, you have pursued us, you have wanted us, 
that you have, by your Spirit, brought us to yourself. You have caused us to have faith, the faith that is essential, Lord, that could not be our own, but, Lord, even that has been a gift uh, to us. Lord, you have caused us to know the joy of of being yours, wherein we should be greatly uh, encouraged and blessed and rejoicing. I pray this place would become a place where God's people sing with great emphasis and great excitement and exuberance, Lord, uh, concerning the messages of the songs that tell us that you are ours and we are yours. So, Lord, cause us to go out and celebrate in our own heart, in our own mind before you, in our presence, uh, in your presence, in prayer, to celebrate being yours and just rejoice in being yours. Make us to be excited about the gospel and great defenders of the gospel as well as witnesses and ministers of the gospel. Thank you for your holy word. Continue to bless us as we look to it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.